All right, so hi everyone. Our lecture for today is about work and kinetic energy. This is part one of module five. Part two will be about potential energy and conservation of energy. So what will be what will we be learning in this chapter? So in this chapter, you'll learn what it means for a force to do work on an object and how to calculate the amount of work done, the definition of the kinetic energy or energy of motion of an object, and how the total work done on an object changes the object's kinetic energy. And then we will also talk about how to use the relationship between total work and change in kinetic energy when the forces are not constant. The object follows a curved path or both. And then last is how to solve problems involving power or the rate of doing work. So let's have this example of Katniss shooting a bunch of sour worms flying in the air. And we want to find the speed of the arrow shot from the bow. So it's not enough to apply Newton's laws because the bowstring exerts varying forces on the arrow that depends on the arrow's position. So this means that we can't use the techniques we used in the previous module. So we will need to look into the work done and the energy exerted by Katniss. So apart from that, we will also be tackling the principle of conservation of energy. So when Katniss pulls the bow, that is her storing potential energy. When she releases the bow, that is her converting the potential energy to kinetic energy. So we will learn that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It is simply converted into a different form of energy. So there are so many applications of this concept, like in electronic circuits. But in this chapter, we'll, we will only be focusing on mechanics. So with that, let's begin with the concept of work. In the first slide, we saw Bart Simpson and his friends going up a steep street. So as you can see, Bart starts to feel breathless and tired the longer he biked uphill. So this is an indication that Bart, Bart was doing work. So we can then state that an object is doing work if it exerts a force on an object to make it move over a distance. So if you look at this image on the upper left, these people are pushing the cars uh, closer uh, to the car in front of it. So they are exerting a force on this object and the object is also moving closer to this car. This means that they are doing work on the car. It's different if you push a wall though, because um, the image in the upper right, let me get my laser pointer. The image on the upper right, it's true that you are exerting a force on the wall, but this does not mean that work is done because the wall does not move. So there is no displacement. We'll talk about uh, this more in part two, but for now, let's focus on those that do have work done. So we can see here um, two instances where people are exerting forces on, on something. And how does our body do that? Well, the image here shows um, fibers in our muscles and our ability to do work comes from the skeletal muscles. These muscles can contract, which will then exert forces on the tendons that are attached. So what can we say now about work based on these observations? Let's look into it further with a model as is on this image. We will again consider the object as a particle, ignoring the rotation or changes in shape. We can see that the box moves as a constant force F acts on it, and it undergoes a displacement S, and the force is in the same direction as the displacement. So now we can see that the work done by the force under these circumstances is just the product of the force magnitude and the displacement magnitude S. So the work is equal to F times S. This means that the work done on the object is greater if, the great, if, if either the force or the displacement is greater. Okay, so now we have here a person 
trying to push a stalled car. We already know that if the person pushes the car through a displacement with a constant force in the direction of motion, it is given by W equals F times S. However, if he pushes it at an angle phi to the car's displacement, then this means we can split the force into its components and only take the force component parallel to the direction of motion, which is Fs cosine F, sorry, rather F cosine phi. As you can see, the form Fs cosine phi is the same as the scalar product of two vectors here. So we can then write a more compact, uh, compact equation for work equal to the dot product of the force and the straight line disp displacement. So remember that the dot product of two vectors is just equal to a, b, cosine, phi. So here we applied the same thing, and that is how we arrived at this equation where the work is equal to the dot product of the force uh, and the uh, vector of the displacement. So what is the unit of work? It is one joule and it's named after the 19th century English physicist James Prescott Joule. This is something to remember also um, the con uh, conversion of the joule. So it's equivalent to um, one newton meter and that makes sense because the work is equal to the product of the force which is in newtons and displacement which is in meters. Okay, so we have here our first example, the work done by a constant force. So Steve exerts a steady force of magnitude 210 newtons, about 47 pounds, on the stalled car in the previous um, figure. As he pushes it a distance of 18 meters, the car also has a flat tire, so to make the car track straight, Steve must push at an angle of 30 degrees to the direction of motion. How much work does Steve do? B. In a helpful mood, Steve pushes a second stalled car with a steady force F equals 160 newtons in the times I hat minus 40 newtons times J hat. The displacement of the car is S equals 14 meters times I hat plus 11 meters times J hat. How much work does Steve do in this case? Okay, so let's start with A. You are given a force and you are given an angle. So, and you're also given a uh, distance, which is the magnitude of the displacement. Okay, so this is a typo. Um, I'll just correct that uh, in the future, but Wait, no, I think I can do it right now. Um, let me change my pen. Right, so this should have an S here. Sorry. Should be F S. Okay, so this should be Fs cosine phi. Okay, so with that, um, you plug in your values 210 as the force, S as the magnitude of the displacement, cosine phi is, uh, has an angle of 30 degrees, and plugging all of that, you get the work is equal to 3.3 times 10 to the uh, raised to the third power joules. Next question, um, you have here your uh, you have here your force and you have here your displacement. And we will be using, um, we will be using uh, W equals F dot S. And we will only be, and with that, so we know that um, we don't have to use the, the AB cosine phi because we can use um, the expansion of F dot S in terms of its components and unit vectors. So we have Fx times the displacement, the X component of the displacement X plus Fy times the Y component of the displacement S. So plugging in the values, we have 160 newtons times 40 meters plus negative 40 newtons times 11 M. So remember, this is a scalar product and that is why 
our unit vectors became equal to one. All right, so the work that we got for B is 1.8 times 10 to the third power uh, joules. Okay, so this is where it sort of gets tricky when you solve problems, and that is because the work can be positive, negative, or zero. And if you get this wrong, your calculations can be way off. So when will work be positive? In row A, you can see that if the force has a component in the direction of the displacement, as in our example in the last slide, then the work will be positive. You can also think of it as when phi is less than 90, then your work value must be positive. So how about uh, when, when will work be negative? In the second row, row B, you can see that if the force component is in the opposite direction of the displacement, then the work will be negative. So you can also look at it as when phi is less than 180 and greater than 90, then the work value must be negative. And lastly, what about zero? Well, in row C, you can see that if the force component is perpendicular to the direction of the displacement, then the force does no work on the object or rather the work is zero. Another way to look at it is when phi is equal to 90, it's shown here, then that means there is no work. Just remember also that we discussed uh, scalar products and when the unit vectors are different, meaning i dot j or j dot k or k dot i, they are all equal to zero. So in this case, it follows that, okay? So this is surprising. But one example of situations where forces are acting but the work is zero is when a weightlifter holds a barbell for five minutes. And again, this is because there is no displacement, even though he is using up energy as he holds the barbell up. When the weightlifter brought the barbell up to that position or lowers it back down to the ground, that is the only time when the, the weightlifter will do work on the barbell. So what about positive and negative work? How does that look? So we have here again the weightlifter. The, the first image here, um, this one, shows the direction of motion of the barbell is downward. And this, is, well, this will always be the case due to gravity. If you were in space, then it's a different story. But on Earth, this is our case. So here on the second image, uh, it shows how positive work is done. In this case, the barbell is the one doing positive work on the weightlifter's hands. And this is because the force of the barbell on the weightlifter's hand is in the same direction of the um, barbell's displacement. So regardless of the weightlifter bringing the barbell upward or lowering it down, the hands of the weightlifter will always do negative work on the barbell. And this is because the hands are keeping the barbell from falling to the ground. So if you have several forces acting on the object, how do you then uh, get the work? Well, you can do it in two ways. The first is to compute the work done by each force and add all of the work done by each force. Or you can also get the total for force first and then you get the total work. So both of them will yield to the same answers. Okay, so here is an example of how to apply exactly that. All right, so a farmer hitches her tractor to a sled loaded with firewood and pulls it a distance 20 meters along level ground. The total weight of sled and load is 14,700 newtons. The tractor exerts a constant 5,000 newton force at an angle of 36.9 above the horizontal. A 3,500 newton friction force opposes the sled's motion. Find the work done by each force acting on the sled and the total work done by all the forces. So Remember, um, we have to visualize what it looks like, and then we have to draw a free body diagram in order for us to understand the situation better. So this is um, all the forces acting on the sled. Okay, so method one um, shows how you can get the work by getting the individual components work first and then adding them later. 
So as you can see, all of the work along the vertical um, part is all equal to zero. And this is because the direction of motion of this sled is all along the x axis. So that means we're left with getting the x component of the force from the tension and also the frictional force. So with that, we get um, the work from the tension uh, through Ft Fs cosine phi. So we're already given a value for phi, and we also know the force that it um, the tractor exerts on it. And then we also know that um, we also know that it went a distance of 20 meters, which is just the magnitude of the displacement. So plugging all of that, those values in, the, the work done by the tractor on the sled is 8 kilojoules. Next, so we know that the angle um, with respect to the positive x-axis um, of the frictional force is 180. And we also know that cosine 180 is equal to negative 1. Applying the same equation as earlier, F s cosine 180 this time, where F is 3,500 newtons and s equals to the same 20 meters and times negative 1, which is cosine 180, giving you a uh, total of negative uh, 70 kilojoules for the work done by the frictional force. So getting the total work, we have W total is equal to the work done by the weight plus work done by the normal force plus work done by the tractor plus work done by the frictional force on the ground. So then we have 80 kilojoules from the uh, work done by the tractor minus 70 kilojoules um, by the friction, uh, frictional force. So with that, the total work on the sled done by each force is equal to 10 kilojoules. So, okay, so a second way to do it is to just get the sum of forces first and then um, get the total work along the x axis. So, first we get the x components. We don't really need to do this part because we won't be using it, but I just put it here uh, so you can also study how to get the um, x and y components of the force for Newton's laws. And anyway, going back, so we have here the components along the x-axis is just given by, um, so we have positive for the force parallel, uh, force of the truck parallel to the x, um, direction of motion, which is along the x-axis. So that's why this is positive and a negative um, for the uh, frictional force because it is going um, in the opposite direction of the direction of motion. So that's how we got 5,000 newton. Oh, sorry, yeah, 5,000 newtons times cosine um, 36.9 minus 3,500 newtons equals to 500 newtons. This is um, the total force along the x-axis. So now that we have that, and we already know that the displacement is 20 meters, so we just plug that into our f dot s equation, giving us 500 newtons times 20 meters, which is equal to 10,000 kilojoules, which is the same answer that we got earlier. So I don't know which one will work better for you, but either way, um, both answers are acceptable. Right. So in our previous section, we only focused on how work is done when a force is applied that results the object to move a certain displacement. But in this section, we will talk about how work is done when the speed of the object changes. So yeah, it's from Despicable Me. <laughs> so how does work relate to change in speed? In this image, we see a block sliding um, on a frictionless table and the force acting on the block are its weight, the normal force, and the force exerted on it by the hand. In the first image, you can see that 
a force is applied to the block in the direction of motion. So this means that the work done is positive, as we have discussed earlier. And an important thing to note is that the block also accelerates, so it speeds up. On the other hand, as is on the Im uh, second image or the middle image, if you apply a force opposite the direction of motion, then the work done will be negative again, as we have discussed earlier. And since it's in the opposite direction, its acceleration is in the direction of the force. So this means the block will lose its speed and it will slow down. Lastly, what, um, what if the block is sliding and you apply a downward force or you push it down? Well, this doesn't change anything for the speed, so it remains constant. In this case, the total work on the block is also zero. So we can then conclude that when a particle undergoes a displacement and it speeds up, then there is work and it is positive. But if it, slow down, if it slows down, then there is still work and it is negative. And if the particle maintains its speed, then there is no work done. So constant speed or um, when it's at rest, then that means there is no work done. That also means, remember from Newton's laws, that there is also no force done on the, the object. So we can already see that there is a relationship between work and a changing speed. So let's look further into that and come up with an expression for kinetic energy. The image on the upper right shows a block of mass m and it moves uh, from x1 to x2 and a constant net force is applied in the direction of the motion uh, of the block. So let's now make a force equation that involves the speed instead of the, the acceleration. Recalling our discussion in Newton's laws, a constant force means a constant acceleration. So this means we can also apply our kinematic equations for constant acceleration in order to get an equation for the force that is dependent on the velocity. With that, we use the kinematic equation v squared v2 squared equals v1 squared plus 2ax times the magnitude of the displacement s. Rearranging that equation, we get the acceleration in terms of the initial and final velocities, um, v2 squared minus v1 squared over 2s. Substituting this to Newton's second law, f equals ma, we get, wait, just so I'm sure you can follow, wait. Okay. So we get, Wait, where are we? Rearranging this equation, so this equation, by multiplying both sides by one over s, one, uh, sorry, by just by s, we get fs equals one half mv2 squared minus one half mv1 squared. And so this is how we derive the work energy theorem because f times the magnitude of the displacement s is just equal to the work. But before we get into that, we have this quantity, one half mv squared. And this is what you call now the kinetic energy. It is the energy of motion of a particle. So kinetic energy is a scalar quantity that depends on the particle's mass and speed, and it doesn't include the direction of motion. Unlike work, the kinetic energy is always positive. And it is zero when the object is at rest. So as it is energy, the SI unit for kinetic energy is a joule, just like work. So you can check that by the units too, which is equivalent to kilogram meter squared over second squared, which is just equal to one newton meter. And one newton meter is equal to one joule. So going back to our derived equation a while ago, we found that the total work can also be represented by the change in kinetic energy. And this is what you call the work energy theorem. One thing to note though, is that we can only use this in terms of an inertial frame of reference. And this is because we use Newton's laws to derive this. And this is the only ap applicable for straight line motion with constant forces. All right, 
So now we're moving further into our discussion by discussing how to um, strategy, uh, this strategy in solving problems regarding work and kinetic energy. So again, we, we're back to step one. We identify the relevant concept, concepts. So use the work energy theorem when you want to relate an object's speed at one point in its motion to its speed at a different point. And then for problems where time is involved, it's better to use the relationships among time, position, velocity, and acceleration. So remember that uh, velocity is just a change in displacement over time. Acceleration just change in velocity over time. So um, regarding uh, problems like that, remember to use those. So next is set up the problem. So again, we have identifying the initial and final positions of the object. We have to draw a free body diagram that shows all the forces acting on the object and then choose a coordinate system again remember that the free body diagram is for the object so that means that um you need to tilt it in uh in in terms of uh, how the object is actually moving we like remember the hanging uh the one sliding on an incline uh and all that so i uh, next is list down the no unknown and known quantities and then decide on your target variables and next is to execute it. So calculate the work done by each force or calculate the total force first and then calculate the work done. And then check the signs if they are correct. It's important. So again, I'm reiter reiterating that work must be positive if the force has a component in the direction of displacement. Sorry. And then work must be negative if the force has a component opposite to the displacement. And lastly, work must be zero if the force and displacement are perpendicular. Next is to add the amount of work done by each force to find the total work. So as I've mentioned, you can also calculate the vector sum of the forces first, then find the work done by the net force. And then uh, next is to write expressions for the initial and final kinetic energy. And then one note here is to use them again. Okay, so the mass and weight, we already um, discussed the difference between them. And in this case, for kinetic energy and also force, we use the mass and not the weight. Okay. And then next is to use the work energy theorem. This is if it's um, essential to it. Of course, um, you don't always have to apply the work energy theorem. But in these problems, um, it's possible that you might. Okay. Next. Uh, lastly, of course, evaluate your answer. Uh, check if your answers make sense. Did you use the right formula? Did you use the right units? Were the values calculated properly? Do you have enough zeros? And then remember that kinetic energy can never be negative also. So you have to check your solutions right? <laughs> if that happens. So maybe uh, one of the values just had an error. And then, as usual, pat yourself on the back for a job well done if you were able to answer it. Okay, so first example we have, uh, we're back to the sled in the previous example. Our results from, and uh, we have our results from example uh, 6.2. So suppose the sled's initial speed is V1 uh, equal to 2 meters per second. What is the speed of the sled after it moves 20 meters? Okay, so here we are given, um, yeah, we are given a weight, okay? Wait, I'll go back here, 6.2, okay? We were given, all right, we were given a total weight, okay? So that is how we got 14,000. Sorry, 14,700 newtons over 9.8 because uh, weight is equal to mg. And rearranging that equation, we get m equals w over g. Uh, 14,700 newtons over 9.8 meters per second squared. And we know that one newton is kilogram uh, meter squared per second squared. So, yeah, no, sorry, kilogram meters per second squared. And so that means you're left with. 1,500 with kilogram as your unit and your answer is 1,500 kilograms, okay? Now, getting the final velocity. So we will be using the 
uh, work energy theorem in this case. So we will have to solve first k. what is k1, what is k2, and then we will move on to plugging all of these values in order to get v2. Okay, so let's start with the initial kinetic energy k1. So uh, we know that the kinetic energy can be uh, can be calculated using one half mv squared. So we already have the value for the mass, 1,500 kilograms, and your initial velocity is also given at two meters per second. So one half times 1,500 kilograms times uh, two meters per second squared is equal to 3,000 kilogram meters squared per second squared, giving you a, an initial kinetic energy of 3,000 joules. Now, for the final kinetic energy, we do not know what V2 is, but we can calculate for K2. So with that, we plug in the work energy theorem, which is given by W total is equal to delta K or K2 minus K1. So K2 is just equal to K1 plus W total. But we already got the W total from the previous um, example, which was just 10... Um, uh, sorry, 10,000 joules. Okay, rather. Okay, so with that, to get K2, we just need to add K1 plus K2. So that's 13,000 joules. And uh, again, this is just to reiterate that one joule is equal to one kilogram meter squared per second squared. And then, all right, so now we have our value for K2. We can use the equation for kinetic energy, K2 equals one half mv2 squared. Um, and rearrange that to isolate V2, giving us V2 equals the square root of 2K2 over M. Plugging in our values, we have 2 times 13,000 kilogram meters squared per second squared over 1,500 kilograms. Let's get the square root of that. And our initial, uh, sorry, final speed is given by 4.2 meters per second. Okay, so... This is an alternative solution that does not <laughs> make you for, uh, that does not force you to use um, the the work energy theorem. It's quite shorter, but remember that the the acceleration is constant here. So this means we can use um, this kinematic equation where v two x squared is equal to v one x squared plus 2ax. Okay, why did I say it is constant? This is because we were we are only looking for the acceleration at um, this point. Okay, so wait. Yeah, okay, so we are only looking for um, that one. So that means we can use this equation. So a is equal to ax equals, so this is from Newton's second law, uh, F equals MA, but we're only getting the X component because that is where the direction of motion is. So that's why it's 500 newtons over 1,500 kilograms. So we got this from uh, the same way, M equals uh, W over G. And then we also got um, the force. Oh, I did not show it here. Oh, it's from the previous, sorry. <laughs> from the previous problem. Okay, so wait, let's go back to that. Okay, so we were able to solve the forces along the x-axis as 500 newtons. okay? So that's why we didn't need to do that anymore here, okay? And that is how we got um, 0.333 meters per second squared. So now we have the value for the acceleration along the x-axis. We can plug that into our equation here. So, um, so we already have our v1, we already have our acceleration, we are also know our displacement is 20 meters. So plugging all of those values, v2 squared is equal to 7.3 meters squared per second squared. Getting the square of this um, on both sides, we get v2 equals 4.2 meters per second, which is the same one that we got. But I think it's, for me, it's much easier to related using the work energy theorem. Even though it's a longer solution, I think it's more um, straightforward than uh, think, memorizing all of these kinematic equations, okay? So if ever you do try to answer problems in the homework, um, it's, it's your choice which one is easier for you. Okay, next uh, example is forces on a hammerhead. So the 200 kilogram 
steel hammerhead of a pile driver is lifted three meters above the top of a vertical I beam being driven to the, this is the I beam being driven uh, into the ground. The hammerhead is then dropped, driving the I beam seven point four. Oh, sorry, this is the I beam. <laughs> sorry, this is the hammerhead. Okay. The I beam 7.4 centimeters deeper into the ground. The vertical guide rails exert a constant 60 newton fr friction force on the hammer head. So use the work energy theorem to find A, the speed of the hammer head just as it hits the I beam. So that's point two here. And then uh, the average force the hammer head exerts on the I beam. Ignore the effects of the air. That's good. Okay, so first one is, of course, to imagine the situation. This is our eye beam. This is your hammerhead. And it goes in uh, three points. So point one is its initial point. Point two is the minute it um, hits uh, hits the the eye beam. And then point three is after the point of contact where the, the eye beam um, becomes lower by 7.4 centimeters. Okay, so, ow, okay. <laughs> so the free body diagram for the falling hammerhead includes the frictional force of 60 newtons times the weight and its velocity is going downward. So th this is the free body diagram for that. And then we have the free body diagram for the hammerhead when it pushes so at this point when it already pushes on the I beam. So we still have our frictional force of 60 newtons and um, the the weight mg. Then we have the normal force. Okay. So in order to find the speed of the hammerhead, we will first need to find the forces and then the work, and then we will be using the um, the work energy theorem. Okay, so for so for this instance, let's first find the force from P1 to P2. And we know that the forces are only along the x uh, the y-axis. So that's why we have this. So we have the weight and the frictional force. So the weight is equal to um, the mass times the uh, times, sorry, the weight is equal to mass times the gravitational acceleration. That's 200 kilograms. Yeah, was given times 9.8 meters per second squared, giving you a weight of 1,960 newtons. Friction is given as 60 newtons. And then, um, all right. So we also know we will be we will be putting since the direction of motion is downwards. So our positive y will be here. So this means that the frictional force will be on the negative y side. Okay. So remember, always choose the um, the the coordinates in terms of the direction of motion. So that's why w is equal to negative f. So that's one thousand nine hundred sixty newtons for the weight minus sixty newtons for the frictional force. So this means that your net downward force is equal to 1,900 newtons. And then we also have here a value for the, um, for the displacement. So that's just basically the, this point minus this point, which is three meters. So, all right, I forgot to put a decimal point there. It's too big. Okay, there's a pen. So there's there's a date there's a decimal point there. right decimal point okay so that is your displacement so getting the total work we can just um put the summation of forces along the y-axis times the displacement s1 from point one to point two so that's 1900 newtons times uh three meters and that that is how we got the total of the work total of uh, sorry, the total work of 5,700 joules. With that, we have the work, uh, the total work, and then we have the work um, work energy theorem, W total is equal to K2 minus K1. And we want to know what 
um, K2 is first. Okay, so we also know that because it's starting at an initial point, it was at rest. So this means that there is, um, there's no velocity yet. So this means that the kinetic energy is zero. Okay, so that is why we have K2 minus zero. And we also know that the equation for kinetic energy is one half mv squared. And that is how we got this. And then we have a similar equation as the previous problem. So um, isolating v2, we get uh, the square root of two total work over the mass. And uh, plugging all of our answers, we have two times 5,700 joules over 200 kilograms. Get the square root of that. And your V2 is equal to 7.55 meters per second. So this is the speed of the hammerhead at point two as it hits the I-beam. Okay, so the second one is to find the average force the hammerhead exerts on the I-beam. Okay, so this time we will be looking at point two to point three. So our displacement here is 7.4 centimeters, which we have converted into 0 0.074 meters in SI units all the time. Okay, don't forget to convert them. All right, so getting all of the forces along the y-axis, we have W minus F minus N. So here, take note that the N here represents the average value of the upward force during the motion. And by Newton's third law, F12 is equal to negative F21, the average downward force will also have the same magnitude as N. Okay. And that's what we are looking for. We just want to find the average force the hammerhead exerts on the IV. Okay, so going back. <laughs> so to get the total work, we need to find um, W total equals to W minus F minus N um, S2. And we also know that the K2 is equal to 5,700 joules. So why is K3 equal to zero? So that is because uh, at point three, it already stops, so it's at rest. So that means there is no kinetic energy. Okay. So um, here we equate the uh, equation for. So this is the the summation of forces along the y-axis times the displacement, and we also know that the total work is also equal to the initial, the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy given by the work energy theorem. So with that, we equate um, these on both uh, on opposite sides and isolate, sorry, uh, let me do this marking. So with that, we isolate the N here and then so that's equal to W minus F minus K3 minus K2 um, over S um, from point two to point three. And we already know this from the previous problem. And then we also, uh, we were, uh, we all, we, this was given. So we were also able to um, get that value. And then again, as I've mentioned, because it stopped already, there is no kinetic energy. So that's why at point K, uh, point three, the kinetic energy K3 is equal to zero. And then K2, we just solved that in the previous one. So it's 5,700 joules over a displacement of 0 0.074 meters. This means that the average force the hammerhead exerts on the I-beam is 79,000 newtons, okay? So I hope this is clear because now we will be moving on to work and energy with varying forces. So in the previous discussion, we talked about work done by constant forces. But what if the, vor the force varies this time? So one example are springs. If you stretch a spring farther, the harder it is for you to pull it. So this means the pulling force you exert uh, on the string will not be constant. So this part will discuss how we can solve for the total work given varying forces, and also if it is not a straight line motion. Let me bring back my laser pointer. Okay, so let's start with um, work done 
by a varying force in a straight line motion. So when can we experience this? Well, imagine you're driving a car and you're on the main road. So there are multiple intersections. So this means there are also multiple traffic lights. And this means that you will need to alternately step on the gas and the brake pedals. Stop and go. Okay, so if a particle moves along the x-axis from point x1 to point x2 as shown in the figure, and uh, at point 1, the force exerted is F1, and at point 2, the force exerted is F2. We have here a, an image as a graphical representation of how the force will vary with position. So this means um, in order to find the work done by this force, we would need to divide the displacement into narrower segments. Okay narrower segments as shown in, again, this image. So we can then approximate the work done by the force um, during segment um, del x a here um, as the average x component of force f a x in that segment multiply by the, the, the x displacement del x a. So this means we can just get the work done by the force from x1 to x2 by adding the work done from each of those um, components or segments. So um, Fax times del xA, Fbx times um, del xB, and so on. But if the number of segments become very large and the width of each segment become very small, then this means the equation we had a while ago becomes an integral um, of fx dx from x1 or the point 1 to point 2. So this is the initial position and this is the final position. So we can then say that the total work done by the force can be represented by the area under the curve between the initial and final positions. Okay, so this is where your knowledge, more of your knowledge for calculus comes in. But you won't have any complex ones here, so don't worry. So now we have a general expression for the work done in a straight line motion. So we can check if the one we learned in the previous discussions will still work. So we consider fx as a constant. So this means the integral of fx dx is equal to fx times x2 minus x1. So this is because we treated fx as a constant. So this means it will not undergo the um, integration. So we're left with fx times x2 minus x1. And this is x2 minus x1, as you can remember, is just equal to the magnitude of the displacement s. Okay, so to interpret what this means graphically, we look at the image here. So this is the graph and the area under the curve of fx as a function of x holds uh, for a constant force because w equals fs. So if there, uh, if so, w equals fs is just the area of the rectangle where height is equal to f and s is equal to the width. Okay. So I mentioned um, springs at the beginning of this section, and that is because we will be discussing Hooke's Law. So Hooke's Law is equal to F equals Kx, where K is a constant, uh, for, uh, force constant, sorry, or a spring constant of that spring. So we know that the unit of the force is in newtons, and x is in meters. So this means that the unit of uh, of unit of unit of k, sorry, is n over m. Hooke's law is the relation that the force is directly proportional to elongation. So elongation meaning um, the, um, the how long um, it can stretch, okay? How the string can stretch, given that the elongation is not too great. Because, of course, if you stretch it too much, you can break the spring or change its shape. 
So springs are good examples of applying firing forces. So when we stretch a spring, we have to do work. We have to apply equal and opposite forces to the ends of the spring to gradually increase the forces. So imagine here we have our character Slinky from Toy Story. If you pull his upper body and hold the lower body stationary, then this means that the force exerted on Slinky's upper body is the only force that does work. So if you look at the image on the upper left, oh, sorry, upper left here, um, that is a simplified drawing of what happens to Slinky when you pull the upper body and keep the lower body stationary. So there is the force of you pulling the upper body and an equal and opposite force on the lower body as you hold it with your other hand. But since the lower body remains stationary, then that means uh, there is no work done on the lower body, as I've mentioned before. So how do we apply Hooke's law to our equation for work earlier? Well, um, what if we want to know how much work we will need done in order to stretch Slinky from zero to a maximum value, maximum value of capital X? So we can just integrate over the fx dx from zero to big X or capital X. And using Hooke's law, we substitute that for fx. So that's kx dx. And that is how we got one half x, uh, sorry, one half k times capital X squared. So we can also approach it another way. The graph on the lower left shows the graph of the force versus the distance. And the shape under the line is a triangle. So we can then just use the formula 1 half base times height to get the work. So that's just 1 half x multiplied by kx. And it's equal to 1 half kx squared. Okay, Because the height is kx, the base is So you can think of work as equal to the average force, also kx over 2, multiplied by the total displacement x. Now, what if Slinky was already stretched at a distance, as shown in this image? And you want it to stretch at a greater elongation here at x2. So this is your initial position now, x1, and you want to go even further, x2. So that means you just need to integrate from x1 to x2. Substituting fx dx, you get um, 1 half kx2 squared minus 1 half kx1 squared. So you can also use um, the area of a trapezoid in order to get the same answer. And that is because um, the shape of the area under the curve is a trapezoid. So before we move on to the next slide, I just wanted to share something again about muscles. So um, they have tendons that attach them to the bones, right? So this tendon shown in this image here, um, in, uh, all right, so they are long, stiff, elastic collagen fibers. So they actually act like springs. They don't act like ideal springs though. So in order to study the work they do when you stretch, then you will need to get the integral instead. Okay, so this is an example of work done on a spring scale. A woman weighing 600 newtons steps on a bathroom scale that contains a stiff spring. In equilibrium, the spring is compressed one centimeters under her weight. Find the force constant of the spring and the total work done on it during the compression. Okay, so in order to get the uh, in order to get the force constant, we can just rearrange uh, Hooke's law f x equals k x as k equals um, f x over x. Okay, and then we also know that the woman was weighing. Um, 600 newtons. So this is the weight. So using Newton's third, third law, we know that the we know that the normal force 
that the woman acts on the spring is negative 600 newtons. So that is how we got that. And then, um, and then we also know that it went from, it went from uh, zero to negative one centimeters. So, which means um, it compressed it instead of elongated it, okay? So positive X is in the direction of um, stretching the spring and compressing it is in the direction of negative X in this case, okay? So that's why it's negative uh, one centimeter. So changing that into meters, um, we have negative 0 0.01 meters. Plugging all of that into our equation, your value for the force constant for this spring is six times 10 to the fourth power newtons per meter. And then, all right, the next question is find the for, uh, sorry, the total work done on it during its compression. So again, we will be using here what we have learned about um, the springs. So this is our um, equation that we got from a while ago about total work. So we just plug in the values for initial and final, um, final, so, sorry, initial and final uh, displacement. Okay, so that is, sorry, distance, sorry. All right, so that is, so X2 is negative 0 0.1, 0 0.01 meters. And um, you know that the final, um, final work here should be zero. And that is because the person is already at rest, okay? So that means one half times uh, the K, six times 10 to the fourth power times X2 squared. So that's negative 0 0.010 meters squared, giving you a um, total work done of three joules, okay? Not that big. <laughs> All right, so we have tackled what happens if the magnitude of the force varies, but what if the direction will also vary? So now we will be looking at how to get an even more general expression for work. And that is by looking at the work done for motion along a curve. In the image above, we see, um, so we see, a particle moving from P1 to P2 along the curve. So that means we can also divide the curve into many infinitesimal vector displacements, and we can get, we can call each of those segments as DL. So each of those DLs are tangent to the path at its position. So we let F, the force, at a typical point along the path, and phi will be the angle here, the angle between F and DL at this point. So we can then have this general equation for work as it moves from P1 to P2 as the integral of the dot product of the force and the displacement DL. So take note that we are only considering the parallel components of the force because again, if the force is perpendicular, that means that the, that force does not do work on the particle because, because it is not in the, um, because it is 90 degrees from the direction of motion. Right, so here is our example. So an air track glider of mass 0.1 kilograms is attached to the end of a horizontal air track by a spring with force constant two newtons per meter. Initially, the spring is unstretched and the glider is moving at 1.5 uh, meters per second to the right. Find the maximum distance D that the glider moves to the right if uh, A, if the air track is turned on so that there is no friction and B, if the air is turned off so that there is kinetic friction with coefficient UK equals 0.1, uh, 0.47. Okay, so this is our uh, drawing from the book. And then we have this, these, two, um, these two free body diagrams. The first one is when the air, um, the glider, the air track rather is turned on. 
So that means there is no frictional force acting on it, but there is a force um, by the spring. And then also the weight. And then we also have the width friction. So that's, there's the uh, kinetic, uh, sorry, the frictional force. And then we have the force of the spring and the weight. Now, because the air track is turned on, that means there is no friction. So um, we can then proceed to get our, um, get this. So remember, because we were looking for um, the ma maximum distance d, this is just the value for x. So we can substitute that to our work energy theorem. And because the final, oh, sorry, the initial one is, um, initial distance is zero, that means your initial kinetic energy component here will become zero. So that is how we got W equals one half kD squared. And we need to get D. So that means that um, we will need to um, dive deeper into the components of the work in order to use that to get this one. Okay, so we know that the total work is just equal to negative one half kD because this is um, this is k two, okay? Uh, sorry, this is um, k okay is equal to zero uh, minus one half mv one squared. Okay, why is this zero? Um, because the initially it is moving, but after that it stops. So that's why the kinetic energy is zero uh, minus one half mv one squared which is just, again, I have mentioned it is initially moving, right? It's initially moving at 1.5 meters per second. And then isolating D, we get V1 times the square root of M or the mass over the force constant K, which is, is it given? Yes, it is given mass, given mass given. Yes, spring, uh, force cons constant is also given, and we already have an initial velocity. So that's 1.5 meters per second times the square root of 0.1 kilograms over 20 newtons per meter, giving us a distance of 0 0.106 meters. So this is the maximum distance that the glider moves to the right if it's on. But what if it's turned off? So I would assume it would be shorter because then there's frictional force, right? So how do we begin? <laughs> it's quite um, long, but you'll understand. Um, wait, I'll try to explain this best again. Okay, so the, we know, as you can remember, that to get the frictional force is just mu k n, where n is just equal to mg because of um, Newton's third law is just equal to the weight, the magnitude of the weight. So that's why we have here mg. So in order to get the work done by the frictional force, we need to get um, fk times fs. Basically, it's fs cosine phi, right? So because it's um, on the opposite direction, we will need to get um, the cosine 180. Uh, the angle between that, the frictional force and the direction of motion is 180 degrees. That's why it's there. Okay. Hopefully you can recall um, our, our discussion earlier. Okay. So that's why uh, F or the frictional force times S, which is just the distance, cosine 180. So it's equal to FK, negative FKD, which is equal to um, should be negative mk mg times d. Okay, so you have now this equation that you can use for your work energy theorem. So your work energy theorem, um, so that's m negative mk mg d minus one half k d squared. So this is our equation earlier, right? We just had an additional component here for the work, and then it's equal to zero minus one half mv1 squared. So as you can see, you can treat this as a quadratic equation where um, one half k is your a, mk mg is your b, and one half mv1 squared will be your c. 
And remembering the quadratic formula equal to negative b plus or minus squared b squared over minus 4ac over 2a, we substitute these values, negative mu kmg plus minus squared of mu kmg squared minus 4 times 1 half k times 1 half mb1 squared over 2 times 1 half k. Um, solving this, we get um, this relation. So I hope you can work out this equation. If you can't, you can send me a message so I can um, derive the whole thing for you. Okay, so d is equal to negative mu kmg d over k plus or minus the square root of m kmg over k squared plus mb1 squared over k. So now that we have um, this equation, so um, let's uh, let's let's try to because it's so long, right? Let's try to solve um, each little component first, starting with. Uh, mu k m g over k. So we have here uh, your mu k equal to 0.47. That's already given. We are also given the mass of 0.1 kilograms. And we also know that the gravitational acceleration is 9.8 meters per second squared all the time. And we also know that the um, k is equal to 20 newtons per meter. So that means this part of the equation is equal to 0 0.02303 meters. Next component is this second one. So that's mv1 squared over k, which is just 0.1 kilograms times you already have 1.5 meters per second squared um, over uh, 2 newtons per meter, which is just 0 0.01125 meters squared. Oh yeah, I forgot the... I forgot the square here, because this also has a square. Okay. <laughs> So um, just take note of those corrections. Okay, so with that, we so this is the same as this, and that is why um, we have negative 0 0.02303 meters plus minus squared of 0 0.02303 meters squared plus 0 0.01125 meters squared, giving us two values of, uh, for the positive side, it's, when this is positive, it's equal to 0 0.086 meters. If it's negative, this is equal to negative uh, 0.132 meters. However, the displacement is uh, here, in this case, is a positive value. So this means we take the glider's displacement as d equals um, 0 0.086 meters or 8.6 centimeters, which is less than the value that we got if the air track is turned on. And that uh, you can see already uh, through our calculations that the frictional force does have a, an effect on the total distance that the, the glider was able to um, achieve. All right, so all right, next example. So it's more of this first part is more of um, conceptual. Um, and because we, the answer is zero. So anyway, at a family picnic, you are appointed to push your obnoxious cousin, Throck Morton, that is an obnoxious name also, in a swing. His weight is W, the length of the chains is R, and you push Throcky until the chains make an angle theta knot with the vertical. To do this, you exert a varying horizontal force F, that starts at zero and gradually increases just just enough that Throcky and the swing move very slowly and remain uh, very nearly in equilibrium throughout the process. So, what is the total work done on Throcky by all the forces? And B, what is the force? Uh, sorry, the work done by the tension T in the chains? And C, what is the work um, you do? by exerting force F and we are ignoring the weight of the chains and the C. So this is our drawing of our obnoxious cousin. And then here is the free body diagram for um, that cousin. Okay, so we have the tension um, at an angle theta. So we will, be, we will be considering the components of that, T cosine theta and T sine theta. And then we have um, our direction of motion uh, along 
this way. So that's why the F um, is this way. And then we have the weight. Now, again, as I've mentioned, there are two ways to calculate the total work. The first is to calculate um, the, uh, the work done by each force and then adding that total work. Or you calculate the work done by the net force. Now, it says that Rocky is in equilibrium, um, near, very nearly in equilibrium. So we'll consider um, that he is in equilibrium. And we know that if, um, if the object or the particle is in equilibrium, meaning it's at either at rest or at a constant velocity, that means the net force on him will be zero. And that means that integral of that net force will be equal to zero. And that is why our answer for this first question is that the total work done on Throcky is zero. So next question is, what is the work done by the tension T in chains? So as you can see, the tension is um, perpendicular to the direction of motion because, okay, he is sitting upright and, it, and you can see the direction of motion is um, uh, the same um, angle as the seat. The kid is um, parallel to the seat and tension, uh, the chain here is perpendicular to it. And we know that if the force is perpendicular to the direction of motion, then that means that force does not do work on the particle or the subject or the object that we're trying to get um, the, the motion or, or observations of. So that means the work done by the tension T or the chain is equal to zero also. Now, our next problem though, right? So now we will be talking about um, the third question here. What is the work you do by exerting the force F? So now we will be considering both the X and Y components of the force in order to get the work done. Okay, so first we have to get Fx, and we know that along the Fx, there's the force you exert on the swing, and then uh, minus T sine theta, which is the X component of the tension of the chain, and it's along the negative um, X axis. And then we have um, here, the for the Y axis, we have T cosine theta, which is the Y component of the tension of the chain, and then the weight of the swing and the chain as negative W. We equated them to zero because of Newton's first law. Remember that this is, uh, they are in equilibrium, meaning the, the velocity is constant. So that is why we were able to use that. If it wasn't, then we will need to use F equals M8. Okay, so um, with that, because it's equal to zero, we can easily find um, the equation for force equals to T sine theta, but what is T, right? So we will need to find what that is. And with that, we will need to also equate um, this second equation for the force equal to W equals T cosine theta. And because this is the same, we can just isolate the T from this equation, T equals W over cosine theta, equal to F equals W over cosine theta times um, sine theta. And then we get F equals W tangent theta. Now for the displacement, so here we have displacement, which is um, like an arc length, right? And we know that the R is given and the theta is given. So that's why um, our displacement here is given by S equals R theta. So remember that when uh, in the future we talk about pendulums and all of that, um, this is a very useful equation because it's for the arc length, okay? With that, but we need to know the uh, the value of those little um, segments, right? So in order to do that, we will need to get um, dl equals ds. And um, so remember here that the only thing that's changing is your angle. So that is why we have our constant r times the theta as your dl. Okay, so going back to the um, the integral, 
we know that W is given by x1, x2 times f cosine theta dl. Substituting the values that we have presented here, we have f equals to W tangent theta times uh, cosine theta times dl is equal to rd theta. And we also know that tangent theta is equal to sine theta over cosine theta. So the cosine theta here cancels out, leaving us with um, this uh, integral from zero to theta naught w times r times sine theta d theta. And we know that the integral, so these are all constants, right? So both of them. So you're left with integrating um, sine theta over from zero to theta naught. And we know that it is equal to negative cosine theta. So we also know that cosine zero is equal to one and cosine theta naught, we don't have a value for that. And that is how we're left with negative WR times cosine theta minus one times, uh, and it's equal to W equals WR times one minus cosine theta if we bring the value of the work inside the parentheses. Okay, so this is your answer for the work done, uh, work you, you do by extruding the force F. Okay. All right. So the last part in our discussion is about power. So when we talked about power earlier, uh, we didn't consider time. So what do you call um, the change in work over a period of time then? Well, that is what you call power. It is the rate at which work is done. So the average power is given by P av equal to delta W over delta T, and the instantaneous power is just dW over dt. So what is the unit of power? It's called a watt. And one watt is equal to one joule per second. So another commonly used unit of power is the horsepower. And one horsepower is equivalent to 746 watts. So we can also express the power in terms of force and velocity because the velocity is just the change in displacement over time. So another fun fact I have about muscles regarding power is that the skeletal muscles are the ones providing the power to make animals move. So there are two types of muscles, the aerobic and the anaerobic. So the muscle fibers that rely on anaerobic metabolism, they don't require oxygen and they produce large amounts of power for a short period of time. On the other hand, the muscle fibers that rely on oxygen or the ones that have aerobic metabolism, they produce a short amount of power for a longer period of time. So in the image of this fish above, um, it shows that both of those muscles um, so the darker one here is used for sustained swimming. So this is the aerobic metabolism. And the lighter ones are used for brief bursts of speed. So this is your anaerobic um, muscle, okay? All right, so just a little fun fact. Okay, so here is how we can apply um, the equations we had for power. So each of the four jet engines on an Airbus A380 airliner develops a thrust a forward force on the airplane of 322,000 newtons or 72,000 pounds. When the airplane is flying at 250 meters per second or 900 kilometers per hour or roughly 560 miles per hour, what horsepower does each engine develop? Okay, so let's not think about the, uh, the units first. We will convert that um, later. So we will focus on our equation, which is P equals F1B. Okay, let's go back to our previous slides. Okay. Okay, so this, we're using this equation. So the magnitude of this is just P equals V times V. V times V cosine um, theta. Okay. And your theta here is just equal to yeah, it's just equal to, to 1. Okay, so that's why F1V. So, all right, going back. So we have our force of 3.22 times 10 to the fifth power newton. So put it in scientific notation. So um, take note of this exponent. And then times the velocity of um, 250 meters per second. 
giving you um, power of 8.5 times 10 to the 7 watts or in horsepower. So you divide it. So one horsepower uh, divided by 746 watts, giving you um, power of 108,000 horsepower. So that is um, each the horsepower that each engine develops as the thrust um, is given. Okay. Great. Okay, so next we have a five kilogram marathon runner runs up the stairs to the top of Chicago's 443 meter tall Willis Tower. This is the second tallest building in the United States. To lift herself to the top in 15 minutes, what must be her average power output? Express your answer in watts, in kilowatts, and in horsepower. Okay, so how do we start with that? First, we we ask what is the the weight of the runner, and that is given by mgh. So, um, all right. So that's five. Uh, 50 kilograms rather times 9.8 meters per second squared um, times 443 meters okay wait sorry let's go back to our equation so that's um the average power is equal to um e the del uh, delta w over delta t okay all right so going back to this one so we have so this is not, um, this is not the weight. This is actually the work, um, <laughs> the work done by the the marathon. Okay, so we have two point seventeen times ten to the fifth power joules over nine hundred seconds. And all right, so how come we only considered the the work after, um, or yeah, the work after um, the the runner moves, and this is again because she was stationary at first. So that means the the work before she started to move is zero, and also the time before she moved is zero. So that is why we have this. So nine hundred seconds. How did you get that? So that is because we converted this into seconds, which is just nine hundred seconds. Okay, and that is how you get point two four one kilowatts, and I will leave it up to you to um, convert it to horsepower, okay? So try that out. And then uh, method two, okay, method two is to use the height over the time. Okay, so that's just basically um, distance over time, okay? So that's 443 over 900 seconds, and that is how you got uh, 0.492 meters per second. And because you're only considering the one that's parallel, cosine, um, yeah, cosine zero is one. So that is how you get um, mg, v, mg times V average. So that's 50 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second times 0.492 meters per second, giving you an average power of 241 watts. So I just want to go back to this um, equation and how we got it. So this is just basically Fs, right? And mg is the magnitude of the normal force because of um, Newton's third law. So that is how you got mgh. So remember, this is capital W. It just looks like a small letter, but it's it's supposed to be the work. It was mgh, where s here your your displacement here is h okay so i didn't include uh, the whole solution um here so that's why it might be confusing but again um just remember um that um remember that you can also um use newton's uh newton's third law here to find um, the magnitude of the normal force okay and then that's it for module one. Module two will be about more about um, potential energy and the conservation of energy. So yeah, till till the next one. Thanks uh, for uh, tuning in.